Recording in progress. Hey, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the latest episode of Allure of the Poor. I am so excited to be here today because my guest, we met in New York. We've met a couple of times, but I don't know if you remember, Julia, our, our wonderful uh, rooftop uh, evening yes. of some I fun do. After, after, I think it was a ZAP event. Um, mm -hmm. So it's been wonderful. So my guest today is Julie St. John of Penricelli Winery. And yes. I, I mean, there's not much to say. I'm going to say pretty much the majority of people who listen to this podcast are going to know about you and your winery. And that is something spectacular because the oh. wines are great. The people are great. So I am honored to have you on the podcast. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. And happy holidays, everybody. We are in the middle of the holiday week. So thank you for taking time out of probably a busy week for other reasons than just winery stuff this week to sit down with. Yeah, year end is always, yes. <laughs> it's <laughs> always exciting. Yes, yes. So let's talk first about the, the family itself. You guys sure. started really you bought land the family bought land in 1927 in dry creek and that yes. was long long before anybody had ever heard of dry creek or it was an ava so right like, why that area tell us about the family history and how they settled there sure well my grandparents uh giovanni and julia came from uh the Redding area of California. So there were no, there were no grapes over there. They had met, they were both from Italy, came over separately, met uh, when my grandfather was selling vegetables to my great grandparents hotel. And uh, then um, they got married and they had some, and started to have a family and they were looking for a place to settle down. And I, you know, it is lost to me why or how they came to this particular piece of property, but there must have been, it, the family who had this property since the early 1900s, uh, they were Italian, so there may have been, you know, some sort of connection there. Um, and they uh, were in a bit of a distress. They, they needed, because of prohibition, had ended their winery. They were selling grapes for as long as they could, and then the bottom fell out of the market. 1927, it was just a hard time for most people. And so my grandparents picked up a, a shuttered winery, a home, and 25 acres of Zinfandel. And that is where our story begins here in Dry Creek Valley. And you're right, it wasn't, AVAs and all of that didn't come around until much, much later, uh, until the 1980s for us. Uh, but um, they basically set down their roots here uh, they ended up having four children. My father is the youngest of four, and he was the one born right here in this office that I'm sitting in. Um, that was, <laughs> was the home that he grew up in and the home that I grew up in with my sisters. So it's a uh, very, I'm looking out the window at the same view that I've looked out uh, for since I was a kid. And uh, now it's my office. <laughs> <laughs> you know that 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 really is something to think about that that you you know these generations and it's still this same house and it might have changed you know what the reason of the house is you know or the purpose of the mm -hmm. house but to have such a tradition and so much hearth you know hearth and home there it, you know mm -hmm. nestled within your business mu must be you know near and dear yes it is. And it, yeah, it's the pretty amazing when you think of it, you know, nine decades later, uh, the family is, st we're still family owned and operated. Uh, there's still plenty of family involved with everything. And yeah, to come kind of home in a way is, is pretty cool. Not many people can say that. Right. That's absolutely. And you know what, in today's world with some, so many wineries, being bought up and just being digested, no other better word for it other than digested by these big conglomerates. It's always nice to see that there is still a family winery and a family that isn't just calling themselves a family winery, a family winery that truly is family in whole, you know, working there. And, right. Yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it is. It's, it's, 
it is very special. I mean, just thinking about, you know, the generations, I mean, thanks, thanks to my grandparents, thanks to my dad and my uncle who were the second generation members that continued on. Now there's third, I'm third generation along with my sister's my husband works with me, my brother-in-law is the vineyard manager. I mean, it just kind of just keeps going. And even fourth generation is represented. Um, my nephew, Mitch, is out there working in the vineyard with his dad. So, you know, we're passing it along. Hopefully, by the time we get to the fifth generation, we'll see them become involved. And uh, it'll just be something that will turn over as we go forward. So that leads me to my question. Like usually my first question is how does somebody get it? You know, how did you find your wine way basically, Mm -hmm. but you grew up in it. Was there ever a point where you're like, this is not the path I'm going to go on. Or was it, this is the path I want to go on. Which, which direction were you? Yeah. That's great because uh, for me, when I went away to college, um, I did not have plans on coming back. I wanted to get away from the small town of Geyserville as fast as I could. And I ended up uh, at Dominican University in, in Marin County. And uh, I majored in English with a writing emphasis. And so I had plans on going into the publishing world to be an editor. So as I worked my way towards that way, you know, to get over to the East Bay, uh, my sister uh, was pregnant with her first child and was working in the tasting room. And I started to commute back and forth between my job down there and my job here on the weekends. And uh, one day my dad and I had a conversation in the old tasting room warehouse and uh, he wondered if I would be interested in coming to join the family and at that point you know wine was pretty intriguing to me I'd gotten over the whole small town not wanting to come back and that kind of thing and so I uh, I dove in started in the tasting room and worked my way up to where where I am today <laughs> and uh, that was 36 36 or 37 years ago it's it's been a while it's it's, it's my life, basically, and did not expect it to turn out that way. And so the English degree, the writing, yeah, a different... <laughs> different tack, okay. but I use it. I write, actually, when the pandemic started, I was writing a newsletter about once a month and uh, doing blog posts okay. uh, under my blog, Vino in, Vino in my Dino. And uh, I started writing a, a newsletter once a week, Um and it's been, it's kind of helped. I mean, it's, it's a lot of fun. I, I have not run out of ideas yet. And um, I get, I, my readership, it, it's so great. I get to hear back from them, uh, if, especially if something has hit them uh, in the right spot. Right. <laughs> and uh, yeah. I get some great notes. I, I just wrote a post this month that said, you make my Mondays because uh, I come in on Monday, I don't read my email over the weekend. And then I come in on Monday, and I get to read all the responses. Uh, if so, like I said, if something is really hit, right, um, I get lots of lots of notes. So it's it's a that's, it's a, good that's a great part of my job. Yeah. So, hey, I made it work. That's good. <laughs> All right. So let, let's go back in history a little bit and um, sure. go. let's go back to Prohibition. Now, I know long before your time, but Prohibition, yeah. uh, Penricelli was a winery at that point and they were selling grapes, correct? That's how they kind of survived? Well, the, we survived. Yes. How my grandparents were able to survive the rest of Prohibition was just selling the grapes, which um, they... The, the previous family just had fallen on hard times. And so the vineyards were still here. We're in good condition. And so we could, we could send, sell them to head of households. So in the area around us, there were many people of European descent who made wine at home. Uh, and the great part about prohibition, even though it was a dry time, is that you could apply and get a permit to make your own wine, 200 gallons per family, per head of household. And that's about 84 cases. So I, I always like to say there's a lot of happy families during that time because they kept our vineyards going and they got to enjoy their own homemade wine. And I think my grandfather, who didn't come from a part of Italy where they had vineyard, he was from very far north, up in, uh, very near up in the Alps, basically. And um, he 
uh, I think during that time, have to imagine he was making wine right along with the other head of households and learning the craft. Right. And Zinfandel is really, um, and that's what that vineyard site was, was Zinfandel, right? And right. so Zinfandel played an important role in the prohibition time period, right? Like that was right. really the grape that that made prohibition household yes. wine, kind of. Yes, they were shipped, Zinfandel was shipped. It was one of those, the beauty of Zinfandel, really, and when you try it today, you you understand, is of its, there's a bit of softness to it. There's a bit of fruit. And so that's what made it such a great grape for people who were making wine on their own or shipping it. I know that, that Zinfandel was shipped across the United States to different, uh, wherever the trains would go, they'd stop and bring their carload of Zinfandel grapes. And, uh, but it was because it made wine you could drink nearly as soon as it was fermented. You know, I mean, it wasn't like something today we age, you know, we age it in oak and that kind of thing. And it, it takes on all kinds of complexities. But I think really the beauty, beauty of the Zinfandel grape was that it was, you could make a wine and you could drink it fairly soon after it was completed, the whole process. And so Zinfandel did play that important part. It plays an important part here in Dry Creek Valley. It's been planted here since they first planted grapes, wine grapes in Dry Creek Valley in the mid 1800s. So it was a grape that was burgeoning be even before prohibition. So it was something that was very inherent, very a part of who we all were when we made wine here in Dry Creek Valley. So that's, that's also an important part of its, its place in the history of uh, winemaking here. And what do you think about about Zinfandel that it, it's happy there? There's no other way to say it. It, it is happy in your area. Like, what do you think yeah. about, about, the, about the Dry Creek area, about that area that Zinfandel has just found to be it's, it's a favorite home there? Yes, it is. Um, it, it grows, it thrives very well up on the hillsides, um, and which is where most of it has, has always been planted. Uh, you'll find other grapes planted on the valley floor, but when you talk about Zinfandel and Dry Creek Valley, of which, just a little side note, Sonoma County has about 5,000 acres of Zinfandel planted here, the most outside of San Joaquin Valley. And the... Um, half of it is here in Dry Creek Valley, which is one of the smallest of the four major Appalachians. So we definitely are, you know, Zinfandel is, is part and parcel of what we do here. So getting back to the why, and I think it's because of the, 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 the quality that we get once it's, it's grown on these hillsides that are all around here. And um, I unfortunately lost track of your original question, but I hopefully have answered it or restated so that I, all of a sudden, I, when I do those factoids, I go like, oh yeah, I want to say that, but right, right in the middle of what I was <laughs> I just, you answered, I was just asking why okay. Zinfandel is in love with, with Dry Creek. What, what makes it well, so special there? It's, it's the soils up on the hillsides in part. It's the climate. Um, we have, you know, that fog that comes in uh, during the summer and cools everything off. It's what brings great development uh, across all varieties here in the valley. But for Zinfandel, it's just that nice, that nice combination between the, the climate that we have with the hot days and the cool nights. And of course, the soils are at play an important part too, and, and hillsides because, uh, you know, St. George rootstock is what our Zinfandel is planted on. It's because it is it, it helps the vine to thrive in a challenging um, place because hillsides tend to, you know, they don't have a lot of access to water. They don't have a lot, you know, so they're, they're rocky. Uh, and so, you know, they're, they, they give the vine a challenge. So to give the vine help, uh, this is before we were even here, the grapes were planted on St. George rootstock. And so it helps again to develop the, correct vine structure and things like that so that they can thrive on these hillsides. Mm -hmm. And now going back to your, the Pedrocelli uh, history, you guys started off in 1927 with you, how, not 25? 
hectares? 25 acres. I, right. I, I'm on hectares, acres, right? Oh, he oh yeah. <laughs> no, I belong <laughs> on acres. Um, and then you expanded in 63. So what? how much did you expand? And then, so you started with 25, you expanded, and where are you at now? Because you now have multiple estate vineyards, right? Right. We do. So we started with that original and actually we, um, there was enough land so that we did some more expansion right around here. Cause they would think it was about 90 acres total okay. with 25 acres of vineyard planted. So we now, uh, with in 1963, the brothers started to buy up property. So with that, that actually established about a mile West of the winery, um, two major, three major pieces down there. So we, have 50 acres now planted on what I call the home ranch, okay. the original, and then another 55 acres a mile west of here, all Bordeaux varieties. Mm -hmm. And then we also um, help farm my cousin's vineyard, which is the Bushnell Vineyard, um, about five miles down the valley from us up on a bench, a pretty steep high bench. And that's where another 15 acres of vineyard is. So we, we farm about 120 acres total now just a bit bigger now. Um, just a bit bigger yeah just a little <laughs> and today you guys are you you're getting ready kind of to nudge the fifth generation you had said right to I, well hope. they're <laughs> all under they're they're all under the age of uh, 12 so we'll we'll see. Yeah, we'll see where, where they where life finds them when when they uh, get into high school and college and beyond. So but I bet they enjoy we're, being in the vineyards now, right, where it's they, fun yeah. now. <laughs> yeah, they, yeah. And it's starting them early. I in fact, my nephew, Mitch, he actually started working with his dad when he was in eighth grade over the summers. And that's he worked all the, all the way through high school. When he was home from college, he'd work in the vineyard with his dad. And uh, he actually has an ag business degree from Chico, CSU. So, yeah. Uh, so anyway, but I think it's, it's important, you know, to be out there. You know, that's that's what gets you the love of uh, the growing, the love of, you know, watching something go from what looks like a dead vine right now right. to harvest time where the grapes are, you know, there's nothing like eat. I'm going to do a little commercial. There's nothing like eating wine grapes compared to the grapes that you get in the store. And it makes all the difference. If, if any of you listening out there ever can make it during harvest or have been to harvest, you'll understand it. There's just something so delicious. And Zinfandel grapes are still my favorite of all the, the grapes, um, all the wine grapes that I've tasted over the years. It is. It's very different. I love. I love walking through the vineyard and tasting. And my husband and I have a little game between us. Uh, as it gets close to harvest time, mm -hmm. we taste and then uh, we bet each other who can get the better bricks. Like who can guess the bricks from the taste, and then you right. analyze it and see who wins. Um, and we're pretty right. split. We're pretty. We're, we're pretty good with, with the guessing of the bricks. But uh, that's our yeah. little game we play, it, and it's fun. And it's yeah. it's it's exciting to like look at look at that the growth of that grape, and not just necessarily growth size wise, but right. how it evolves phenolically and all of that. And then the seeds and mm -hmm. you know how how they go from green to green brown to and then brown, and you know it's just right. it, it's fun to watch. It's fun to watch them grow into eventually yay we can pick them and make wonderful wine out of it right <laughs> <laughs> exactly <laughs> yes and 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 that's that's the you know that's the beauty of it you know you chew up the skins and you understand tannin i mean there are just there's little things you know this is that's where all the you know once fermented that's you know why the skins are play that important part because they've got all that flavor but they also have you know all the little bits that make up um, the delicious parts of wine. Right. Absolutely. Now, what I think is very cool, well, one of the things that I think is very cool is that 70% of your winery is women run. And yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thanks to, um, well, I have three sisters and, <laughs> they, and cousins. Thanks to genetics and in the family. <laughs> genetics. And, you're going to laugh when you hear this morning. Uh, did you know that the fifth generation right now is all boys? 
Really? Five, Five boys. generation members are all boys. <laughs> so it may flip again in the future, but for now, and, and yeah, and, and it just is, it, again, it, my hat is off to the previous generations for setting us up for success and for including us in the business and, and for learning it uh, in many ways from the ground up. Um, you know, just having grown up here. And uh, I always say we were such pests when <laughs> we live, we live right at the winery. So we were always down in the cellar or wandering around somewhere being curious. And uh, we didn't learn too much, you know, because it was just a bunch of equipment laying around or a bunch of tanks. But I do remember crawling around on top of the tanks. Uh, I, I cringe now because uh <laughs> I'm, I'm afraid of heights, but I wasn't, I guess, back then. But, uh, you know, it just, it, it, again, having grown up side by side, we got a little off on the subject here, but grown up, growing up side by side with the winery is you do, you, you are just part of it. And uh, I think that's what made us all part of it as the third generation uh, entered it. And now, yes, we are women owned and we are operated and uh, we have a woman winemaker too. Uh, Monse Reese is her name. And uh, she's just uh, 2021 was her 15th harvest with us. Um, oh, wow. She okay. spent the first eight years as assistant winemaker uh, to my uncle John. And then when he passed, then she became the winemaker. And, uh, and she's, she's just done a, a fantastic job too with the wines. Um, just making them her own, looking at them a little bit differently, looking at the lots and that kind of thing. But yes, so getting back to it, yes, we are, yeah. We're, and you're we're actually family. leading the way because I think she was like the third, the third female winemaker in the whole, you know, I think California, but at, at least in the northern, uh, in the northern California, right? She was like the third female winemaker. She's our, she's the third winemaker here at Petter and Shelley, but there are other women who have, have been winemakers uh, for quite, you know, for quite some time here in, in Northern, oh, in okay. the Northern California wine industry. Yeah, there's, um, sorry, I know that may have been a little bit um, misleading, but yeah, we've, we've had, I always like to say we've had three winemakers in our time okay. here in 94 years. And my grandfather was first, then my uncle John. Um, but he had the lion's share because he was winemaker beginning in 1948. So he, he not only oversaw the vineyards, but he also oversaw all the winemaking. So the, everything that changed in between, we've had, for instance, we've had many different grapes planted here on the home ranch. We've had, well, we've had Gewürztraminer, Johannesburg Riesling, uh, Gamay Beaujolais, or excuse me, Napa Gamay for our Gamay Beaujolais that we used to make. And, uh, you know, we've had, so, and then we found, well, that wasn't exactly the right grape for the right spot. And so I've kind of diverted into another subject, but what we have found is you find the right grape for the right spot where it's more site specific than it is like that grape will work. And then you find out, mm, Chardonnay didn't exactly thrive in the warmer end of Dry Creek Valley and neither did Pinot Noir. We had both of them planted on our property. Now we depend on growers to do it who are 10 and 14 miles to the south of us because it makes a big difference. But see, and that's, that's why you just celebrated a couple of years ago your 90th anniversary <laughs> and, yes. and they're so spectacular. And that's why, as I introduced you at the beginning, so many people right. know your winery is because if you just plant because, oh, Chardonnay is, is the go-to grape or, oh, Pinot is the go-to grape and you plant it on your home site and that's right. not where it belongs, you're not going to create the quality that that you have shown for 90 plus years. You've, you've got to right. recognize that the soil has a lot to say in that quality of that fruit. And Right. So. I couldn't agree more because, you know, I mean, even though we made good, I, you know, good, you know, error, Chart, uh, excuse me, I'm going to uh, Gewürztraminer and Johannesburg recent, which are unusual. Right. They were grapes that, you know, it, they were uh, it, they were more of the time than they were 
the right grape for the right spot because now what's planted there in its in their stead are Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot and Sauvignon Blanc because those tend to do well in that area and you you just you discover things you know again it's sometimes we we made a boatload of Chenin Blanc in the 70s it was the one we didn't grow any we bought it from a grower but we made a boatload of it because guess what that was the wine that everybody enjoyed back then Mm -hmm. so we've made changes in the line as years go by and you know it it, again it's not only site specific it's also like your portfolio specific what what do we want to be known for and uh, so we rely uh, definitely uh, heavily on Zinfandel and Cabernet Sauvignon and our Sauvignon Blanc as our our estate white and this is a perfect time because the first Uh wine I want to talk about is this beautiful Uh Zinfandel because I mean, I know you are known for the Zin and Cabin, like you said, the Sauvignon Blanc. But uh, honestly, 100% honesty, Zinfandel is, you know, synonymous with Penrachelli. It, it goes hand in hand with it. Yes. And this is Mother Clone. Now, you guys were bonded the 113th winery. So kind of kind of early on in, in, you know, the bonding age and... I think this is really what you are, you know, known for. But tell us about Mother Clone and the cool facts about about Mother Clone's history. (laughs) Certainly. All right. Well, going back to when Zimadol was first planted on the property, it was in the early 1900s. And so when my grandfather, my grandparents picked up, bought the property, had that original that eventually became known as the mother vineyard and so because it was what was here it was what helped us along through all those years and um by the 1970s though they're reaching 70 years old and it was a time to start thinking about some changes and and not changing variety because we knew that zinfandel we wanted to stay with zinfandel but it was time to consider replanting so um, starting, so by then, uh, early 1980s, block by block, we'd replant. Well, when we named the wine, we didn't name it probably in the early 1990s. It, cloning was a thing, you know, remember Dolly the Sheep and all that <laughs> stuff. And so, you know, we thought, well, the Mother Vineyard and cloned it back into place. And, you know, Mother Clone is a good name for it. So it's, it's a long, it's so funny because I always try to shorten the explanation, but it always turns into this nice long story. But it deserves that's the story, it though. It deserves the story. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it does, because what we did is we ended up playing it all up. We started again with St. George Rootstock. So that's, you, you put that in there. And then we used Budwood, not just from the previous vineyard, which then continued the heritage of that particular one. But we also, if, you know, Joe's vineyard was doing really well just across the way, let's borrow some budwood from there and see how it does on this block over here. And so we did it more intentionally, I think, than the original Zinfandel planting. But so the mother clone is a combination of mostly that second generation vineyard, which is now 40 years old, along with, we have a little quarter of the hundred year old vine still producing. There aren't many left because time will over, when you, once you reach over a hundred, it's kind of hard to keep everything together. And it also is our youngest vineyard. We have three generations of Zinfandel planted on our home ranch. The oldest, the middle-aged, the 40-year-old. And then we have about an eight-year-old vineyard planted with uh, the rock pile clone, uh, which for now is part of the mother clone Zin as it makes its way to maturity. Um, We'll see if we're ever going to do maybe a single plant vineyard from that or not. But that's the beauty of mother clone. It's combining these three generations of grapes along with a nice healthy dose of Petite Syrah. That is, again, part of our tradition. Ever since we've been making Zimbadol, it has Petite Syrah has always been grown side by side with it. It adds structure, it adds color. Zimbadol can be a little on the pale side. So you want, if you want to, you know, give it a little dose of color, definitely Petite Syrah is the grape to blend. And uh, I also think that it helps it to age a little longer than um, your average Zinfandels. I think it gives it again that that aging potential. And For those, I like it's always tough with the green screen, but <laughs> yeah, there it is. So 
you know, when it comes to the descriptors, because, you know, unfortunately, this is not a scratch and sniff uh, session. <laughs> that would be awesome. We can't, we can't share, you know, this wonderful aroma. But um, if you just imagine two words, berry and spice, mm -hmm. and uh, you've got a little bit of that ripe berry going on in there. And a Dry Creek Valley, uh, to me, has its own spice. It's almost a white pepper in quality, sometimes a freshly ground black pepper. And so you get a bit of that peppery quality along with the berry. And the thing that I, I get with your Zinfandel is it's, it's, the pepper that comes out is to me freshly ground. It's, you know, it's not, yeah. you know, it, it's when they sit there with, with that pepper mill and it's so freshly ground. But I also, and this is where people think I'm a little strange, but I also get your, I get cinnamon stick, like that is shaved cinnamon stick also. Not, again, it's, it's got to be not just you're taking a cinnamon stick and putting it up to your nose. It's when you right. grate that cinnamon stick. That's what I get. And it's so, I'm sorry, people listening, because you're missing out. It is so <laughs> pronounced. Um, mm -hmm. As you bring it up to your nose, it's, it's you don't have to stick your nose in the glass to mm -hmm. get that to get that right. It just kind of wafts up. Yes. Yeah, yeah. That the warm baking spices. That's that's another key mm -hmm. key uh, complementary part of of the zin, uh, and it sometimes it can smell like berry pie. Sometimes it can you know I'm just think about other you know kind of common descriptors to use. But the cinnamon, I like that. I just used a cinnamon stick this week, and so I, it's fresh in my mind. Right? It's it's you've got to grate it. It's and yeah. you know people are like really, it's different than when you just stick a cinnamon. But to me, it is right. sticking a cinnamon stick yeah. up to my nose is very different than grinding that cinnamon and getting the small particles. You know, it's just got more yeah. more, more essence to it when right. it's grinded and and that's right. what that's what i get it's and it's like such a nice wine and it's consistently such a beautiful mm -hmm. wine it, it's it's like you know that when you open this mother clone that it's going to be you know a happy a happy night you know but yes and it's a nice balance between those spices the and the fruit you know lots of times zin can be and I love Zin, so take this <laughs> Zin can be overly bearing in one realm. You know, it can be just all spice or it can be all fruit, you know, like that, that dry yeah. type of fruit or or even that, that jam in your face fruit. And the other thing that Zin can have a tendency to do is alcohol in a glass. And right. this is like the perfect balance between all three. Like, you know. mm -hmm. yes, thank you. Yeah, that you know, the, the alcohol thing is always, you know, Zinfandel wants you'll often hear stories about Zinfandel bunches having everything from raisins to green berries on them. Mm -hmm. And you know, when you get them in the, the tank, sometimes you know, you try to, to hit the window so that you know, uh. Our winemaker one time, Monse quipped, we make spice bombs, not fruit bombs when it comes to Zinfandel. And they're more, they are more on the spicy side. And I think try, just really attempting to pick it at the right moment. I mean, really, it's it's key to not, you know, our, you know, our Zins, I'm going to have to look at the, the, there we go. This is a 15%, but you would not, no. you wouldn't guess it. It doesn't have that, the volatility that some of of the um some, some of the zins are known richer, for <laughs> some zins have which is okay and people love them and and they're great but there's finesse i guess is what i would say there's more of a finesse to our mother clone zinfandel when it comes to you know the balancing act uh, between all the all the things all the aromas you know and things that can turn ugly if if you're not careful um, or at least not ugly, but I, yeah, <laughs> a different it's, category. Yes. <laughs> but the th this is the finish is very long, and it's it carries. It's got body. It's got you know there's alcohol in it because of the body of it, but it's not it's not in your face. It's not that volatile 
alcohol that that burns your tongue. It's just right. enough to allow it to kind of take your tongue and just let the finesse of it continue right. to end, you know, um, as it carries on. And yeah, it's, it, you know, what? when you do something good, you stick to it. <laughs> that's all I, that's all I yeah. can say. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And now the, your home ranch, right? Your home ranch, you said that is mostly Zinfandel, right? Right. 33, 33 of the 50 are Zinfandel. Okay. And then you have the, oh, I'm blanking on uh, the East Side Ranch. That's where you have right. your Bordeaux varieties. Right. right. Okay. And now yes. you also make, now I don't know, do you make a, a single varietal Merlot? Yes, okay. we do. Okay. I was not aware of that, but you do make, I am aware of Cabernet Sauvignon. Right. So talk there's to the me, wisdom. Yeah. So talk to me about your cab solve and the name, why wisdom, what, what it involves. Uh -huh. uh, uh, I'd love to tell the story because when one of the first pieces of property at, after 1963 was purchased, it was five acres on West Dry Creek Road. So just a couple miles west of where I'm sitting. And they decided to plant Cabernet Sauvignon over there. And it is, uh, it has been now planted for well over 50 years. So it was 1965. Yeah. So when it was 40 years old, however, we replanted. And here's where the wisdom story kicks in. We decided to stay with the same variety, Cabernet Sauvignon. But my uncle John was the one who picked out a clone. And it was really interesting because we've never really fussed much over clones. You know, if, they, if the grape works for the site, you know, not worry about it too much. Anyway, so he picked out clone four, okay. or the Argentinian clone, or, oh. or the Mendoza clone. And it is a, it makes, a, it grows a much smaller bunch uh, than our Cabernet Sauvignon growing across the way, um, because we have about 33 acres of Cabernet Sauvignon planted as well. So this little five acre piece, he, um, planted four and a half acres to the Mendoza clone and half an acre to Malbec. <laughs> and uh, that is uh, kind of the basis for our wisdom Cabernet Sauvignon. And he, when he replanted it, it was about two years before he passed away. And this wine was made in honor in, in, in the beginning, in honor mm -hmm. of my uncle and all the years of wisdom that he had uh, planting grapes here in Dry Creek Valley, making the wine. And we, in fact, uh, even make it a, a little bit different. Some people hold wines back and things like that. We, we actually, in the early years of making wine, would age it for, oh, two years in tanks or oak you know, redwood tanks or oak and then age it another year or two before it's release. And that, that's nearly unheard of these days. If right. you want to, you know, get it in the bottle and you want it six months down the road. So this one took its time in oak, about two months in French oak, excuse me, two years in French oak. And then we bottle it and we wait another year before we release it okay. uh, in honor of that way that we had used to make the, the red wines in the early days. So it's a testament to my uncle. It's a testament to, you know, over 55, you know, 55 years plus growing one particular variety in one place. And it's interesting because it's on what we call the dry side of Dry Creek Valley. It's actually the upside. And it's kind of in its own little spot where when the sun goes down, it's some of the first to go into shadow. Oh, and it just... It is just, it's a lovely spot for Cabernet Sauvignon and uh, they chose the right grape for the right spot for 55 years and going. And the wisdom is, is again, just uh, in honor of all of those years, three generations planning on the same spot, you know, and, and just. And choosing yeah, the right it, clone when it could have been. Choosing the right clone when the time came, right. although. I say usually say when you you have Cabernet Sauvignon in the ground for forty years, nobody ever hears of old vine Cabernet. They no, hear of old vines no. then, but you don't hear of old vine Cabernet. And my brother in law, who who's the vineyard manager, was happy to <laughs> replant 
and start all over again. And it's just been, it's just been, like I said, you, like you said, the right clone for the right spot and the right grape. Yeah. For the spot. So anyway, that's the, that's the background on the wisdom cap. I love when there's stories behind like how the name comes from, you know, there's always something, mm-hmm. but so, sometimes it's just like, ah, oh, I saw the name somewhere, you know, whatever. But when yes. there's true, when there's true reasoning and logic and, you know, care behind what it goes, it's, it's fantastic. Right. Um, yeah. And you're right. You never hear old, old vine cab. And like, why, why do you think Zinn, you know, I mean, mm-hmm. every, every, uh, grape varietal has clones. There's not, it's not just right. a single thing, right? Cab Franc has clones. Right. But when you talk clones, people's minds go to Pinot Noir, right? There's all of the right. Pinot Noir clones. Oh, yeah. Right. right? Mm. And then when you talk about old vine, everybody's mm-hmm. brains go to Zinfandel. Why is there a reason why Zin is, is deemed the grape variety to talk about old vine? You know, I, I think it has to be the um, the fact that they were here, that the vineyards were here, were established, and people held on to them, so that there was when they when they started to bring in things like Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, they those were newer. They were newer to the area, and so I just think that uh, people stuck with Zinfandel because again, people were still if you were growing it and you weren't a winemaker yourself winemakers wanted Zinfandel right. again for the beauty uh, and the ease of this this grape that the delicious wine that it makes and um so I think when it comes to I think it became kind of venerable in a way you know people like uh, that you know there's there's spots on Olivet Road you know with these old old vines that that the Italians planted a long time ago there's spots here in Dry Creek Valley same thing you've got these old the old vine still producing, still going. And I think it's the ease of the grape. It's the tastiness of the grape that kept these vines in place. And then they became venerable and they became the, you know, the wise, the wise vines. Right. <laughs> Instead of wise guys, they became right. the wise vines. Right. And, and other people started to really appreciate them and either started making wine from them. I mean, I could think of um, Kent Rosenblum. Oh, he wow. knew where he knew where all the good, the good stuff was, and he, you know, he. So he, I, he's one of them that I could think of that really went, you know, understood what an old vine Zin could produce, and so he made it part of his his line. And you know, so there's and there's others, Joel Peterson. I mean, there's oh, many yeah. others who recognize that uh, recognize that probably early enough to save them from either development or being torn up to plant Chardonnay, you know? So there's, there's a lot of reasons, but yeah, you're right. It is, it is curious that Zivadel got the moniker of old vine and I, you know, there's some old, I know there are some old vineyards of like the other varieties, but they just, they just don't have the, I maybe the cachet yeah. of old vine then. Yeah. I don't know. It just doesn't. <laughs> maybe it's the old gnarly, you know, that's, <laughs> vines that's what I was about. Because they're yeah. really the w- main ones that are head trained, right? Every all, yeah. the majority of the other vines are trellised, so they all kind of right. look the same. You know, I mean, yeah. to it to a you know general eye, they all kind of look the same. They all do the same thing. They're all hanging out on the, right. on the things, but Zinfandel, they're head trained and. They, they are just gnarly, and as they get old. They gain right. so much character, you know, it, it's, it, it, and it's like they own the wisdom. They know what's happened over the past, you know, years or whatever. And they, yeah, you know, they, they, they are the ones because I, you know, this is kind of an interesting thing to talk about because I think each head prune Zinfandel is its own, as if it's our own fingerprint. Um, the, the person who prunes it, and there's been many people who have pruned these 40 year old vines out here. Um, you, you, you can study the vine and see where they moved and where they pruned for the next year and then how they spread the vine eventually out right. so that it, they could ripen everything. You know, and Pete Segacio and I had a conversation a, a while ago about whether Zinfandel 
head prunes, if at all, we, we both truly believe that head pruning is the only way goblet, the goblet shape of the vine is the only way to do Zinfandel. Um, we've tried to put it on a trellis here at the winery and, um, we, it was not a successful experiment. And um, it, Zimado likes to put its fruit right in the middle of the vine. And when you trellis something, it pulls it out and it, it didn't, it didn't want to do, it was not a, it wasn't a successful experiment in our, in our eyes. Um, so we, we, we feel very strongly that head pruning is the way for Zinfandel. And I think, again, that's why we've got these old vines because they're happy in that way. I mean, they're 40 years old. They're still producing um, the hundred when they reach a hundred, they probably, you know, won't be producing as much, but certainly what they will be is very concentrated right. and uh, okay. flavorful. I just, and this is so, this is so me being weird too. They always remind me of like a hand coming out of the ground. Yes. Like just, I'm, str- you know, I, I'm winning. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm getting out. I'm getting to show you what I can do, you know, type thing. Yeah. Um, but they are. They're That's very a great, winning. great analogy. I'm winning. I, because it is, it's a struggle on a hillside yeah. to get, you know, to get all the things aligned. I yeah. agree. Yeah. And they're just so they're they're so unique. I think that's why people are drawn to them. And I I, I think that that may be why, you know, v- luckily they weren't ripped out to to put something else in. They're, and they're appreciated yeah. for for what they can give and what they continue to give. So yeah, yeah. I don't know, but always always interesting why people gravitate. You know, the clones go. There's clones of Chardonnay. There's clones of everything, but people clones Pinot. You know, old vine right. is in. You know, it's it's yeah. just, it's just what people <laughs> go to. It's just what people yeah. go to. So true. Um, we're getting close to an hour, but I want to make sure because I think that it wow. is an important thing, <laughs> an important aspect of your winery is the sustainability. So right. can you tell us? I, I, this is always like a, a gray area thing because it's kind of like this term that just gets thrown out today. It's the thing to do. And right. there's so many wineries that are, dare I say, jumping on the bandwagon to say they're sustainable or whatever. But there's you have been doing it for a very long time. And so tell right. us, why do you feel that sustainability is so important and what does sustainability mean to Pernicelli? Okay. Well, it's, um, it's all built into the word. Uh, it makes us sustainable. It makes the earth sustainable and it sustains, it goes out into the community and sustains us. And, and I, I know that sounds kind of weird to say that, but it is, um, Part of what we are, we are good stewards of the earth. And when uh, we were certified, we were certified in our 90th anniversary, which was very fitting. And we just have, it, it's, it's just a matter of what, what can we do better out there? Um, that's, that's, I'm answering it in two ways. You asked why, it, and I like the sustainability program because it, you, you reach a certain point where you're certified Okay, but you don't just sit there on your laurels. You then, the next time you're certified, because we get recertified every other year, the winery and then the vineyard. And each year we show the assessor, this is what we've done. This is a project we've worked on and we've gotten better in this particular area. And when I talk about that, it could be anywhere from water, um, how much water is used out for drip irrigation, because that's, we do drip irrigate almost every one of our vines, except the old, old part of the vineyard. Um, it has to do with their cover crops. It has to do with uh, tilling and no tilling, um, taking turns so that the erosion, you know, there's erosion control involved. It, it has, it goes over to harvest where the pumice, the leftover skins and seeds go out, out into the vineyard, they age for a year and then they, then they get turned into the soil to again, just make everything fertilized, but we're, it's, it's the full circle, basically. Um, we use stems for erosion control so that they're not just being dumped somewhere and not used. Uh, there's, uh, in the winery, it, it's more 
what I would call pedestrian, but, you know, it's the lighting, it's, it's the, you know, uh, making sure that the lights aren't on all the time, you're saving energy, um, you're uh, finding different ways of uh, making your packaging lighter, you're, you know, it, it, it's kind of the simple things, it's finding the right tractor um, that has less carbon emission, um, you know, those kinds of things all work towards being sustainable. Um, but again, and I will say it again, because I like the sustainability um, certification because we work on a project and we get better. And then we work on another one and we get better. And it, and it reaches out to all aspects, not just the vineyard and the winery, but also to our employees and, and everybody in the community. It, it is better for everybody to follow that particular uh, sustainability it's funny you said it's the simple things inside, but it's really not. You would think it's simple. The lighting you would right. think is simple, yeah. but for why? Why do so many people not pay attention to that? And that's actually really a rather easy thing to pay attention to, right? Um, right. But there's so many, and not just wineries, just people in general that don't mm-hmm. pay attention to it. And you know the the you know. The thing that I like about the sustainability is, and that you pointed out, is it's not just in the vineyard. It's it extends out. It's how you treat the people and how what the people are experiencing and right. everything. You know, like the tractor. A tractor is a tractor. A tractor is not a tractor. You know, wow. and if you're paying attention to those things, every mm-hmm. little bit makes a big difference. You know, right. And the the key for us was uh, when my nephew Mitch first started working uh, for the family business, he was tasked with doing this, doing this, he's, he's in charge of the certification. He's the one who <laughs> develops the, the programs and he's the one who got it both done in the vineyard and the winery. So it's just nice to have that uh, kind of full circle, you know, and have him have him be part of that. So it's, it's, it's wonderful. He's a busy person. <laughs> he is. Oh, yeah. Because Lori, if you you remember, you probably know there are what two hundred questions at least at in least each of, the certi- in each of the certifications. So that's a lot, that's a lot of information to go through. Anyway, yeah. he's done a great job. And and to keep track of, it's a lot of yeah. information. It is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So one of the things that I love. Um, you know, I, I'm not that I ever really need a cause to drink. Um, but I do like when there are wine holidays and things like that. And we do have, there is national Zinfandel day, which I believe was November 17th, somewhere. Yes. Somewhere. It it hovers. It's, I think that third Wednesday, I think is what it ends up being. I'm not certain, but yes, it was the 17th. Okay. So, uh, the Wednesday, before Thanksgiving, not of the right, right. before Thanksgiving right. or whatever, um, and it's it's put on by the Zap, um, which is the Zinfandel advocates and producers. So mm-hmm. on their website, it's Zinfandel is America's grape. Let's celebrate it. Okay, and I think mm-hmm. we've talked about you know it, the proof that you know this is the one that got us through prohibition and all of this. So as we talk about your your last uh zinfandel here the uh, yes. bushnell vineyard and on it the yes. beautiful 90 year celebration okay yes uh this is a 2019 uh can you tell us a bit more about zap about zinfandel sure. and then bring us home with with that zin and maybe what the difference okay. between those two zins are okay i will all right well zap we've been a member of of zap Zinfandel advocates and producers for many years, uh, practically since they started. I think we were uh, one or two years in. Uh, but uh, the the beauty of this organization is their diligence in getting the word out about Zinfandel. And I think um, you know it's America's grape. It is. Um, it, it's found its home here in California, but it's grown all around the world, and it does it does well wherever it's put. But the the great thing about Zap is that they each year, um, I know the pandemic kind of rammed a few things, but each year they put on a wonderful Zinfandel tasting in San Francisco, and you know thousands and thousands and thousands of people have come through this event. Uh, I think it's been thirty, probably 
close to 30 years going on. And, um, you know, there it's just the opportunity to try the grape from as many winemakers as you can, you can bear in one day, but it, it is, um, but the, the Zap group, it, they've got some great um, projects. They also are doing some heritage vineyards. Um, they're taking budwood from heritage vines that are grown all around the area and they then plant them in one's place and then they're able to monitor them. And I think they even make a wine out of them, mm -hmm. make a Zinfandel mm -hmm. out of them, but they just, they're, they're dedicated to spreading the story of Zinfandel. They've got the Zinfandel trail that you can follow and uh, you know, it, go on the website. They've got videos, uh, all the different winemakers talking about uh, all different parts of the state, Paso Robles, you know, you got all kinds of different areas and uh, it is just nice to see it all in one place, one focus, one grape. So that's the beauty of, of the Zap group. And uh, if anybody is around at the end of January, uh, there's the grand tasting on, I think it's the 28th or 29th, I don't 28, remember which day, 28th. Yeah. Oh, that might and, be the trade, might be the 28th or yeah, yeah somewhere so around there. Right around that time, the last Saturday of January, let's just put it that way. Uh, come and taste some great Zinfandels. You, I think they've got something like 80 wineries times wow. three or more Zinfandels per winery. You're going to have a nice depth of Zin. And uh, the one of the wines we'll be pouring is the Bushnell Vineyard Zinfandel. This grape, this vineyard, has a very long history with us. It goes back to when my grandfather owned it in the 1940s. He sold it to his daughter, Margaret, and her husband, Al Padroni, and they farmed it from the 50s through the 90s. And their daughter, Carol Bushnell, married to Jim, uh, they then took over the vineyard in 1992 and uh, continue to farm it to this day with a little help uh, from our, our vineyard team. It is the difference between Mother Clone and vineyard, Bushnell Vineyard is a pretty much light and day, night and day. The um, this is 100% Zen, so no Petit Syrah. It is from one of their their prime blocks, and it is spicy. It is it is spicy to the extent that it's it's going towards the ground pepper spice rather than to the warm baking spices. Those are, those are more apparent in the mother clone. So you've got like this spice and then the berry comes in behind it. And uh, it is in fact, uh, Monse, our winemaker uses the Barolo yeast for this block. And she says, because Italians like to take it slow and the Barolo yeast slows the fermentation down. So we get over two weeks of fermentation out of this. And it just, these, these levels of flavor that come out of it are just fantastic. So it's, it's a wonderful expression of this vineyard. And uh, again, I just said berry spice for the mother clone. And this is like spice berry. <laughs> so <laughs> if, if I had to use two words to describe it, but yeah, so that's, that's our Bushnell's in. Well, that, that is awesome. And the, I have to go back to the, to that grand tasting. I, whoever yes. came up with the marketing for this year is, is so clever because it's all back to the future concept. And right. I think the grand tasting is, or there's a winemaker's dinner and it's the yes. enchantment under the sea winemaker's dinner. Uh, so <laughs> it is so clever. So um, it, go online and check it out. And can you uh, tell people where they can find you so they can go online and of course. place some orders for these amazing wines and find out even more about you guys? Oh, thank you. Um, Pedroncelli.com is all you need to do is go in there and discover the website. And, you know, there's an online store if you're so inclined to give these a try or you're welcome to stop by our tasting room. Our cellar door is open seven days a week, except for those major holidays. But other than that, we're here uh, ready to pour and uh, get your feet dirty when you go across the street and look at the mother clones in vines. <laughs> See, people are going to love that. Going into the vineyard. <laughs> That's fantastic. And uh, appointment, non-appointments. Uh, we are, we, if you could make a reservation, great. Uh, we have walk-ins as staff is available. So, you know, that's the whole pandemic story going on right now. So if you just give us a heads up, you're coming, we're happy to accommodate you. And also on social media, they can yes. find you on Facebook, 
Instagram, the whole Twitter, every once in a while, we throw something over there. Uh, yeah, so you'll find us under Petroncelli Wine or Petroncelli, just look for us out there. Uh, we'll be there. And I see, I see you have a little visitor there that's been coming and uh, saying hi. Who is that? Yeah. He uh, is gone now. My husband took him home, but uh, it, that was Jasper, our Australian shepherd. Yeah. He was getting a little bored. I was hoping he wouldn't, sometimes he starts to moan. Oh, can we go now? <laughs> but he, yeah, he probably is at the dog park right now. Oh, he's having a good time then. He's having yeah. a good time. Yeah. yeah. So I, I saw his little head pop up earlier before and I was like, yep. oh. He did. I know. I was like, oh, Jasper. <laughs> he just wanted to be part of it. Absolutely. And deservedly show, so. He absolutely yeah. belongs in there. But I want yeah. to thank you so much for taking time oh. out and visiting with me. And thank, thank you for the wines. They... Uh, I knew they were going to be spectacular, but now I'm tasting it again. Uh, it is <laughs> spectacular. Uh, and we are um, we are going to finish the bottle because my husband did not allow me. He was like, you are only allowed one glass in there because um, so, <laughs> he's looking forward to it also. But he uh, is making um, one of our favorite things to go with your wine. He is making homemade nachos. So... Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Oh, that's perfect. Oh, the the wine will go very well with it. Yes, it Wonderful. will. Yes, it will. So he he puts a little spice into, you know, into the tuck, into the nachos, and we have right. a multiple, you know, shredded uh jack cheese, cheddar cheese, that type of combination right. thing. And then uh, it's ground turkey with um some sort of seasoning. I don't know what he uses, but some sort of seasoning and yeah. This is going to be perfect. So we will enjoy it perfect. tonight. So with that, Wonderful. thank you very much. And I, I hope know. to say Sancha. And I hope to see you in there San Francisco. <laughs> Indeed. All right. Thank you again. And thank cheers, you. everyone. Have a great night. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye.